holy shit that's a bend and here's another one and they like their right angles in Tipperary don't they now to down to Limerick to Adair to the the Vulcan statue or the stony man So yeah, we made a bit of a hames of the, the audio on this, so I have no sound for all of this. You won't hear any of my narration about what the stony man is. So the stony man is a figure of a man carved in stone, set into the front of a an old forge in the area of Stoneville, near Rathkeel in County Limerick. Uh, it's a statue of the Roman god Vulcan, who was the god of um, blacksmiths. The history of, of Vulcan is that he was, when he was born, he was so horrendously and outrageously ugly that his mother uh, couldn't bear to look at him, and she banished him into a volcano. And while inside the volcano, he learned the secrets of fire and forging. Stoneville silver mines were nearby this this forge, and the building may have been a silversmith's workshop, and later on may have been used as a forge. Um, Stony Man himself is, is a figure cut in stone of a man working in an anvil. Uh, the sculptor who made this uh, sculpture is, is it's attributed to a man named Martin Scanlon. And he was from Blossom Hill in Rakeel, and it's around the 1740s that it's alleged to have been made. It's a, a statue of a man leaning on a, an anvil. They say he's a lame man, but you know when you actually look at him, it's it, be just that he's missing his leg, broken off the, the statue, he's also missing an arm on the statue. And the local stories around uh, Stoneville and Rakeel is the stony man is taken down once a year to go to the toilet. Maybe that's why he's standing there with his legs crossed. Anyway, apologies for the, the lack of audio on this little section. I didn't plug in the, the microphone while I was exploring inside the building, but you should be able to hear it a little bit better. There he is. Welcome. Leaning up against an anvil. You see why he's laying, he's missing his foot. I wonder if that just break off or is that there with his leg? He's also missing his hand. He's a scary looking fellow there, isn't he? I've got to be very careful now if he was walking with a blacksmith now and he's only a bit of a clothes wrapped around his Mickey. Imagine the skulls and the bones he'd get. At least he's covering the important bit. Uh, let's snap the picture in a minute. Rambling. Oh, no, no, no. Right, okay. First things first. Oh, the door's open. Cool. Alright. Very best. This would have been the, the smithy associated with the Two naves there. 
Cool. Und lacht auf den Gehirnzeit. Okay, klar. There's electricity in here at some point, yeah? And so was. So long, Vulcan. See you around. So that was the Stony Man in Stonyville near Rakeel in County Limerick. And we're off now on the next on the hunt for the next rally point which is the Solahead Beg Monument in Tipperary. Now, Solahead Beg has a long, long, long history, which I will now tell you about before I forget it. Ah! In 980-something. I've already forgotten it, you see? I, my, ah! Memory of a goldfish. 918, 980-something. Easier just to say the 10th century. In the 10th century, it was the site of a battle between Brian Brew, who was the last High King of Ireland, and the Viking King Ivor, who was King of Limerick at the time. major um, historical significance of Solahead Beg. The second one is that it was a stopping point I just said I'd uh, pop in, pull into the side of the road for a second because I just had a feeling something was gone wrong with the camera and it had. I spoke the words that should not be spoken when using a GoPro. Stop. Because I didn't realise that the the voice controls had been switched on. And when the voice controls are switched on... And when the voice controls are switched on, you say stop or start, the GoPro stops or starts, depending on what it decides it wants to do. And it cut off the story that I was talking, telling about Solahead Beg from 1603, which is O'Sullivan Bear. Because on O'Sullivan Bear's long march from West Cork to Leitrim in the winter of 1603, December 1603 and January 1604, he stopped and set up a camp at Solahead Beg. And that's when the camera cut off the last time. So now I'll have to tell you the whole story of O'Sullivan Bear again. And I have 17 minutes before I get to Solahead Beg. So basically in 1603 there was a, a rebellion, a war between the Irish chieftains from the north of Ireland, O'Neill uh, and O'Donnell, and various other Irish chieftains who rose up against the Crown forces and there was a, a large decisive battle in Kinsale and O'Sullivan Bear was the Lord the Gaelic Chieftain in that area down in the Beara Peninsula and when they lost that battle he realised that his, his castle had been surrounded so he couldn't go back there and he realised that the only fate that would await him in that area was execution for treason so he made the decision to march from the Beira Peninsula, which is like the West Cork, the, the southern tip of the island of Ireland. March north to Leitrim to meet up with the O'Donnell and O'Neill clans. And then to move on to Loch Swilly and to sail for Italy via Spain 
in the hopes of getting support from the Pope to reclaim their titles and their lands. He took the decision to take his, his army, what remained of it, and all of his followers, the women, children, everyone of his clan, and march on foot north to Leitrim, to a safe area where they were by the they were under the protection of the O'Rourke's in Leitrim. And over I think 14 days in the depths of winter, in 1603 into 1604, they walked from West Cork to Leitrim. And all the while they were on the march, they were constantly pursued by the Crown forces who were following them and constantly harassed by rival Gaelic chieftains. When they were in Glengariff, down in West Cork, they made camp in the woods, and then they were informed that the Crown forces were and were surrounding them, with the intention of attacking them at the first uh, light the following day. So they lit campfires, big campfires that could be clearly seen through the forestry in the darkness of the, the winter nights. Some volunteers stayed behind to tend the fires and keep them burning throughout the night. And when the Crown forces attacked in the morning, all they found was burnt out campfires and a few volunteers who had remained to keep them burning through the night, while the main force of O'Sullivan's caravan had, uh, had moved on and stolen a march on them and escaped into the night. But it was a particularly harsh winter and they were marching in snow and freezing conditions. Many of them barefoot and ill clad and poorly provisioned for such a long march and many of them died along the way of exhaustion and starvation. Many of them just slipped away into the night into the surrounding countryside and another interesting point they stopped at was Portumna which you'll see in some of my other videos where I crossed the Shannon. And they were faced with the same problem of crossing the Shannon, but they couldn't use the bridge because obviously that's an ideal ambush spot. So they went into a place locally known as Port Nagopal, or the field of the horses, where they slaughtered their horses, skinned them and used the hides to make roughshod currucks and boats to cross over the Shannon. And all this while they were under constant attack from from rebel or rival chieftains. Hello Mr. Speedvan, you won't catch me today. <laughs> but another place that they stopped on that long march in 1603-1604 was at Solo Head Bay. So there's two historical mentions of Solo Head Bay. One in the 10th century. But Solo Head Bay is most famous for an ambush that took place on the 21st of January in 1919. Now you'll need some historical background for this, but essentially there was a rising in 1916 in Dublin and it was violently put down by the British Army. And when the rising took place there wasn't a great deal of support in Ireland for, uh, for the Republican movement and, and independence. Two things helped to turn that tide uh, so that the majority of people in Ireland were in support of the Republican cause after 1916. One was the treatment of the leaders of the 1916 Rising who were executed without mercy in the days after the Rising. And one man in particular, Connolly, who was a, a socialist, he was very important in the setting up the union movement in Ireland, James Connolly. He had been injured in the in the Easter Rising and he was uh, paralysed, he was in a wheelchair. But no mercy was he given by the, the English at that time because they propped him up in his wheelchair, put him in front of a firing squad like the rest of the leaders and executed him. The other thing that uh, turned the tide of public opinion was the introduction of conscription. Because after 19, 1916, obviously, the Great War was underway and England had introduced conscription into England. But introducing conscription into Ireland was a different matter because 
you were conscripting in England you were conscripting English men to fight in the English army but in Ireland you were conscripting Irish men to fight in a foreign army many many volunteers went to fight in the war in the British army that was one thing but to force Irish men to fight in the British army who they would have seen as their oppressors at the time was met with uh, with extreme resistance at the time and it promoted a kind of a sense of support for the idea of Irish independence and in 1918 there was a general election held and the Republican Party at that time which was Sinn Féin they won landslide victories across the country and on the 21st of January 1919 the elected members the politicians who had been elected to take their seats in Westminster refused to take their seats in the Westminster Parliament and established their own parliament in Dublin and called it the Dáil. It was the first Dáil, which is still the government that we have today. Now, where Sola Head Beg comes into the equation is while all this was going on on the 21st of January 1919 in Dublin, in the little town of Sola Head Beg in Tipperary, some Republican volunteers decided to act on their own initiative and they'd heard that there was a delivery of, of gelignite, which is kind of a an explosive, kind of like TNT, and it was being delivered from the army barracks in Thurlis to a quarry at Solohead Bay, and they made the decision, uh, these volunteers, including Dan Breen, Sean Tracy, Sean Hogan, and a man called Robinson, they decided to relieve the, uh, the RIC of this gelignite and put it to better use in their struggle for independence. So on the 21st of January, they set up an ambush. I think there was uh, six men in the ambush and two cycle um, lookouts. And the plan, well, there's, there's various accounts of the plan. Some say the plan was to intimidate the, the guards, which they expected to be between two and six RIC uh, police constables to intimidate them into laying down their arms and surrendering the gelignite in which case they would be bound and gagged until the volunteers could make good their escape and other volunteers testified afterwards that their intention had always been to provoke a military response and that the best way to have a military response was to actually kill somebody so some of them had the idea from the start that they were going to to kill the guards who were uh, guarding the delivery now on the day it was two council workers who were driving the horse and cart and two RIC constables, Royal Irish Constabulary, who were the police at the time. And the volunteers stepped out from the bushes, aimed their rifles and ordered them to surrender their arms. Now it was lashing rain, it was January so it was miserable and whether there was some confusion or what, no one knows but the story is that the constables went for their guns and the volunteers shot them, stole the gelignite and escaped. That was seen widely as the first engagement of the Irish War of Independence, which raged from 1919 to 1921. And it was uh, only brought to an end with the Anglo-Irish Agreement of 1922 which is where we got the partition and the six counties in Ireland being in Northern Ireland under rule from Westminster. And there's the church. There's a Toyota on the wrong side of the road. Here we are. the heat. So there is the Solo Head Beg Monument uh, with a, a flame on the top of it, top of a marble column representing the rejuvenation, the relighting of the national spirit during the War of Independence in 1919. It's a pretty serious old monument like. 
and along here you have the the four province coats of arms Ulla, which is Ulster, Moon, Three Kings and Munster down there you have Lion and Connacht and along here you have the names of the, the men who took part in the who were involved in the ambush Crow, Ryan, Hogan, Tracy there and this side you have Breen, McCormack, O'Dwyer and Robinson there's the Leinster coat and the Connacht one and this is where the monument is but the ambush site is actually up here this is just the monument to it and two crosses on either side and I think they're representing the RIC men who were uh, <laughs> killed in the ambush and off there in the distance you can see the Galtee Mountains right I'll go and see can I find the, the ambush site maybe good luck mm -hmm. 